Yo, 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 genius, it's your girl Raven Channel in the Omen. Just want to give you a big shout out here from the UK. Um, and Ring IQ. Uh, you're the man. Thanks so much for your support. Welcome to the mother relay we're covering today's top boxing news Ow! well natasha listen there's um she's had a fantastic 2022 we're in talk with a couple of parties at the moment of a fight possibly april time there's talk of chris shields that's an ongoing conversation there's also cecilia brackhouse there's also an opportunity maybe to move down a weight or two divisions um so yeah all that's up in the air at the moment but we're sitting down and speaking to people over the next four or five days and um Hopefully we'll have something, but uh, she's achieved everything she needs to achieve, Natasha. I think it was one of the success stories of 2022. I was just a little bit disappointed she didn't get an, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, a nomination for Sports Personality of the Year during the final six. I think she was well worthy of it. I think she's one of the best comeback stories of 2022. And um, yeah, but like I say, Natasha's going to be able to retire in the next year or so very happy with what she's achieved in her life and uh, what a year for her and, and paul butler you heard what smoke and joe gallagher said natasha jonas may retire from the sport of boxing within the next 12 months and that might be a big part of the reason she's actually entertaining a claricia shields fight in previous videos previous instances i speculated that Natasha Jonas faces certain defeat opposite the ring Clarissa Shields. So for what reason would she want to fight her? It seems a needless risk when she has other options. Not just other options. She has lucrative ones like a Terry Harper rematch for the undisputed junior middleweight championship. A Cecilia Brakus fight, which Joe Gallagher also mentioned. Natasha Jonas could make very good money in any one of those fights, though what must make the Clarissa Shields fight stand out as a potential option it has to be the money sky sports and boxer must be offering natasha more money for that fight than the other fights and because she's already contemplating retirement because she already is a unified ring magazine and lineal junior middleweight champion in the latter stages of her career might be why she's willing to face clarissa but i've said it before and i'll say it again i don't like that fight for natasha even as a swan song terry harper's still out there without a dance partner set to return to the ring in april in defense of her newly obtained wba junior middleweight crown we don't yet know who she's going to be fighting but it doesn't look like it's going to be natasha though by all rights it should be it's the most sensible and sensical fight to make for the two remaining champions but alas smoke and joe gallagher didn't mention terry harpier that unification match that undisputed title fight he didn't mention terry as a potential option for natasha which means they're not budging they'd rather face clarissa and they would rather face cecilia cecilia brakis would be a sensible choice more sensible i think than clarissa shields natasha jonas only faces a certain defeat opposite the ring clarissa but against cecilia it's a more manageable situation and cecilia brakis herself is very much open Open to that idea stating let's go this is a fight that Norwegians would travel for Cecilia Brakis the former undisputed welterweight champion turned junior middleweight contender 41 years old she's in the same age bracket as Natasha Jonas more or less and this would afford Cecilia the opportunity to become a two division unified champion undisputed at 147 potentially unified at 154 if she can actually land the Jonas fight Cecilia was last in action last month in December opposite the ring journey woman Marissa Portillo and she won a points decision Cecilia isn't the same fighter that she used to be in her heyday in her prime I hate to say that it does look like Cecilia lost a step though some of what we saw we can chalk up to ring rust it was Cecilia's first fight in over a year's time she was coming off two consecutive losses two consecutive defeats to Jessica McCaskill their last outing was in March of 2021 and Cecilia didn't see action again until December of of last year well over a year in between the both of those fights for a while there i thought that terry might end up fighting cecilia but natasha jonas she may end up getting cecilia in the ring both fights are viable both fights are distinct possibilities the natasha jonas people may be looking to keep busy with someone someone familiar someone with somewhat of a profile and cecilia Brakis fits that bill if they can get her in the ring beat her then move on to something bigger they do seem to have their hearts set on that Clarissa Shields fight. What could be Natasha Jonas' swan song later on this year, it's not written in stone, it's not set that the two will share the ring as Clarissa Shields does seem to have a plan to return to the world of mixed martial arts, to return to 
the PFL. Does it look like Clarissa's fighting Savannah for a second time, and it's not written in stone that she'll fight Natasha? It's a lot of moving parts. So I'll just come right out and say it. I like the sound of Jonas versus Brakus en route to Jonas versus Harper, but I still don't like that Clarissa Shields fight for Natasha. I don't think the Jonas people are being reasonable here. You go in there with Clarissa, you're likely to lose. And if you do, there's no shame in it. There isn't. Clarissa Shields is one of the best pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the sport. But don't you want to run it back with Terry Harper? Don't you want to settle it? It's for all the marbles. It's for undisputed. It's a fight there's a demand for. It's a fight with a profile. It's a fight that people want to see. And it's a more winnable fight than a Clarissa Shields fight. Clarissa Shields is a no-win scenario for Natasha Jonas. I think they're being stubborn. I think they're being unreasonable. I think that they don't want to give the Harper people the satisfaction, but walking in there with Clarissa Shields, well, that's a disaster waiting to happen. Does it make sense? Though fiscally it might, she might stand to make more money opposite the ring Clarissa than every other fighter, which is likely the only reason they're entertaining that idea, but at what cost? Is it worth it? Men's middleweight news ahead of this weekend showdown opposite the ring Liam Smith. Chris Eubank says Ben no longer has leverage. Calls for no rehydration limits, no 50% splits. Been a lot of talk this past week or so about Connor Ben's ring return. Potentially revisiting the Chris Eubank Jr. fight, but from the sound of Chris, it sounds like there's going to be trouble in paradise. Chris believes Ben has lost his leverage at the negotiation table, saying that the welterweight no longer has any say in pushing for the same conditions as the last time. Yeah, the fight is twice as big. Eubank told the Guardians, Donald McRae, we would need a stadium with 60,000 instead of the O2. Does he deserve that kind of payday after being caught with illegal substances? Probably not. But it doesn't mean I'm going to give up that payday. And now it's personal. It's not just about upholding the family legacy. I now actually don't like this kid. He's done wrong by me. So he's lost all his privileges and bartering power. There are no weight clauses now. There are no rehydration limits. There are no 50% splits. Everything's in my court now. I'm the only fight people want to see him in. That's not necessarily true. Though, alternatives aside, Chris Eubank Jr. taking a hardline stance like that one could very well jeopardize revisiting the Conor Ben fight. Because Conor Ben is the naturally smaller fighter of the two, the rehydration clause, the weight limits, those were intended to be a middle ground to even the playing field between a naturally bigger fighter and a naturally smaller fighter. You see what Chris Eubank Jr. is talking about. You see what he said. All those stipulations that were in play before will not be in play moving forward, saying if you're going to talk about setting an example to kids and the next generation of fighters, then yes, absolutely I would say a ban, a ban in reference to Conor Ben, is required. The selfish side of the coin, which is where I'm a fighter who wants to be in huge fights and get my hands on this kid for what he's done, doesn't want the ban. That entire banned substance fiasco that Conor Ben was all wrapped up in, it only added to the fight's profile, you understand. It only made it bigger, as strange as that might sound. And it's still a possibility, though. Before it comes to that, Conor Ben has been out of action a while. He only fought once, just once, last year. And I think that if they are to revisit the Chris Eubank Jr. fight, it won't be straight away. It won't be Connor's next fight. Connor's next fight might be a Kell Brook fight. Kell Brook, who's supposed to be ringside for this weekend's action, this weekend's fight involving Chris Eubank Jr. and Liam Smith, it seems that Kell is in the running for both a Connor Ben fight and the winner of this fight. The winner of Eubank versus Smith. We talked about this in my previous video. For my money, Kell Brook versus Connor Ben at junior middleweight or middleweight. For my money, that's a more sensible and sensical fight between combatants. It's a more even fight because Kell Brook is a lot more experienced than Conor Ben, but Conor Ben is a younger, fresher fighter with many, many more good years left. For my money, Kell Brook versus Conor Ben is a more even fight than Kell Brook versus Chris Eubank Jr. Chris Eubank Jr. is the naturally bigger fighter of the two. He's naturally bigger than Kell, and he's naturally bigger than Conor. It just seems exploitative of Chris Eubank Jr. to get Kell Brook in the ring at this stage in his career. It's a more even fight with Conor Ben. For Kell Brook it is. It's a more even fight with Conor because Conor's got some drawbacks and so does Kell. Both fighters only fought once last year and have been out of action for some months. Kell's got experience, but Conor's got youth and freshness. Kell's the old lion. Conor 
would be the Young Lion. That fight between those two fighters makes more sense to me than Kell Brook versus Chris Eubank. Though as far as Chris, if by some chance Kell Brook decides to go the Conor Ben route, who can Chris take on? Who can Chris keep busy with? In my previous video, we talked about Gennady Golovkin and how he's not open to facing Jaime Munguia, which caught me by surprise. For a tweet from Mike Kopinger, there appears to be zero interest from the Golovkin people in facing Jaime Munguia. But what about Chris Eubank Jr.? Beyond what's supposed to be the Esquiva Falcao fight that's supposed to go down at some point in the second quarter of this year, beyond that fight, should Gennady Golovkin emerge the victor, would he be open to facing Chris Eubank Jr.? In a situation, in a scenario where hypothetically speaking, Conor Ben ends up facing Kell Brook, is Chris Eubank Jr. versus Gennady Golovkin a viable option, a distinct possibility? I think it is. I think it is because, based on what Chris Eubank Jr. is saying, bringing both him and Conor to the negotiation table could prove difficult. Chris has taken a hotline stance. And if that fight proves difficult to revisit, too difficult to make, well, Gennady Golovkin's still around. He hasn't retired. You can always have Ben Shalom and Sky Sports get in contact with him. See if he won't fight you. Still a champion. It's unclear at this time what exactly Gennady Golovkin's promotional situation is. We don't know for sure that he's going to continue boxing on the DAZN platform. Though, even if he does, for one more fight, just one more fight. Beyond that, maybe he'll be free to move into a short-term deal with people over there at Boxer and Sky Sports. And maybe they could, Bill. Uh... Chris Eubank Jr. fight as a box office fight, a pay-per-view. Maybe. I just don't like the idea of Chris Eubank Jr. exploiting Kell Brook at this stage in his career. I mean, he's already a naturally bigger guy than Kell Brook. Well, how is that different from Conor Ben exploiting him? It's different because they're on more even terrain. Conor Ben is not a naturally bigger fighter than Kell Brook. He's been out just about as long as Kell Brook. It's more even terrain for Kell, in other words. It's a more even fight, more even at least than Kel versus Chris. For my money, the ideal scenario is a scenario where Conor Ben faces Kel Brook and Chris Eubank Jr. faces Gennady Golovkin. Or Yanni Bekalim Kanalai. Just saying, Chris really ought to pick on guys his own side. Really ought to be fighting middleweights, not welterweights, novice welterweights, or... Or quasi-retired fighters, fighters in the latter stages of their careers. No telling if that's how this cookie is going to crumble. No telling if that's how all of this is going to work out, but we'll see. It's a fluid situation between Chris Eubank, Connor Ben, and Kel Brook. And finally, more fallout from Boxing Scene's recent story in reference to Javante Davis's latest pay-per-view appearance, a proposed 225,000 pay-per-view buys, a more generous figure than Rick Glacier's previously reported 61,000 pay-per-view buys. There's been a lot of discourse over this. A lot of damage control. Though for argument's sake, if I go with Boxing Scene's figure, 225,000 reported pay-per-view buys are just at or around there. For argument's sake. You know what that figure tells me after five separate pay-per-view appearances, five separate box office fights? You know what that tells me? That tells me that Gervonta Davis's audience isn't growing. He's plateaued. If I give that number the benefit of the doubt and I go with it for argument's sake, well, that's the same kind of number he always brings in. The audience isn't growing. You're not attracting new eyes and new customers, new buyers. For his fights. You're not. And that's if you decide to give Boxing Scene's number the benefit of the doubt. There's reason enough not to, though for argument's sake, if we do at minimum, that's what that communicates. He's supposed to be fighting Ryan Garcia in his very next fight in a box office fight that, if it actually happens, will likely bring in much more pay-per-view buys than any pay-per-view he's been in so far. That's if the fight happens. But what if it doesn't? What are Gervonta Davis's alternatives to a Ryan Garcia fight? Because so far, his numbers are always hovering at or around 200,000 buys. And after five separate pay-per-view appearances at 28 years old... He's supposed to be some kind of big box office draw, right? Right. That's what they'd have me and you believe. But you know, by age 28, Canelo Alvarez had already sold... 300,000 pay-per-view buys with Angulo, 300,000 pay-per-view buys with Arislandi Lara, 300,000 pay-per-view buys with Liam Smith, 900,000 pay-per-view buys with Miguel Cotto, a million with Chavez, over a million in the first Gennady Golovkin fight, over a million with the second. And that was all by age 28, the same age that Gervonta Davis is now. So how big a star is he really, and how big a star is he 
when the number the median number for his box office fights is just at or around 200,000 pay-per-view buys. That's it. It's almost an affront to the fight fans what Showtime has been doing with this fighter. They want me and you to believe that he's a big box office star, a big marquee attraction, so much so that he doesn't need Devin Haney, doesn't need Lomachenko, doesn't need Stevenson, doesn't need nobody. Because of how big a star he is. Whilst not satisfying the demands from the fight fans, not satisfying the demands of the paying public they hope pays, for Gervonta Davis's fights. The people who want to see him matched tougher. The people who want to see him in there with someone better than a Hector Garcia or an Isaac Cruz, a Mario Barrios. The Ryan Garcia fight is intended to satisfy that desire, satisfy that demand. And for their sake, it's a fight that needs to happen because so far, Gervonta Davis's core supporters, his core audience, it's not growing based on these figures. So if we give Boxing Scene's number the benefit of the doubt, if we go with 225,000 reported pay-per-view buys for the Hector Garcia fight, all that means is that Gervonta Davis, after five separate pay-per-view appearances, his audience isn't growing. They're not attracting new eyes. They're not attracting new customers. Not everybody believes Boxing Scene's number, you know. A Twitter user that goes by the name I am your leader stated, why are you lying for a company that is destroying the reputation of boxing? Why didn't Espinoza or you challenge Rick Glacier's numbers? To which Stefan Espinoza himself replied, I did. Those quote unquote numbers are ridiculous. The actual cable number by itself is in the neighborhood of that whole estimate. There are a lot of people, they don't actually believe the pay-per-view did as well as Boxing Scene says it did. They believe Rick. And for that, they are accused of being haters. Haters, quote-unquote. And for what? For wanting Gervonta Davis to fight the other who's who fighters at this weight? They're not asking Gervonta Davis to do anything that Devin Haney isn't about to do opposite the ring of Sol Lomachenko. Last I checked, that was Javante Davis's homework assignment first. They want to see Javante Davis in there with a better caliber of fighter. And, you know, that's what the Ryan Garcia fight is supposed to be, but is it really? I mean, they better hope that fight happens, because if it doesn't... Look at the numbers. Five separate pay-per-view appearances, and not a single one among them cracked 300,000 pay-per-view buys. What that tells me is that... Unless the matchmaking improves, the numbers themselves won't improve. The buy rate. That's the story those figures tell. His last five fights have been behind a paywall. That already puts a cap on just how many eyes you can get on those fights. Couple that with the fact that these aren't fights that anybody was really asking for. Nobody was asking him to fight Isaac Cruz or Mario Barrios or Roly Romero or the last guy. Ignore the consumers at your peril. They better hope that Ryan Garcia fight happens. Because 225,000 pay-per-view buys ain't nothing to write home about anyway.